Oh, good morning, church. Good morning, church. Good morning, church. To God be the glory. Thank you so much for being with us. Have you looked at the trees? It is fall. It is so beautiful to start seeing the leaves turn as we get ready for the wonders of fall and Thanksgiving and Advent and all those wonderful things that make us truly, truly people of God. So I greet you in the joy of Jesus Christ. I am so appreciative for you being here with us in person and those that are online to witness the word of God and to be in fellowship with each other on this beautiful Sunday morning. As we are grateful to have our worship leaders with us this morning, Ms. Alana Dalton, Brother Dave Burleson, and Sister Deanna Jabot. And topside there we have Brother Tom Kallenberg and Brother Tom Lathan. Welcome back there, Brother Tom Lathan and Mr. Gill Sheridan, our head usher who's available if you need anything throughout our worship experience to, to make you comfortable or to provide any needs that you may have. We are so grateful as God has brought to us this continued journey of our spiritual life. This is um, getting ready to be our last Sunday of September. Can you imagine how time just continues to move on and on and on? So, people of God, welcome to worship. You who woke up early, amen, and you who slept later, amen to you too. You who come often and you who don't. Whether we are first or last or somewhere in between, there is room, hallelujah, Lord, for all of us in God's kingdom. And more than enough grace. If it wasn't for grace, where would we be? If it wasn't for grace, people of God, where would we sinful people be? God gives it abundantly and God just showers it on the saved and the not saved. God gives it to the believers and the unbelievers. God just gives it freely. Joyfully come and let us worship God together. Joyfully come. You may have walked in with some concerns. You may have walked in with some burdens. But we pray that you will give them to God. We pray that you will trust God. And all that is going, in, going through in your life and the life of those you love. And even those you may not, you have a little rub with. Because you got to pray for your enemies as well as those that you pray for, that you love and care for. Because that's who we are as Christians. Christians, we just love. We love, we love, we love unconditionally as Jesus loves us unconditionally. So come, let us joyfully come and have this time of worship. Come as we just celebrate being in fellowship together as Miss Deanna will lead us in our center of music. Amen. Thank you. 
stand if you are able and hear these words. God takes broken promises and turns them into vows of faithfulness. God takes our biggest failings and shapes lives of service. God listens to our prayers of confession and changes them into songs of mercy. Let us come to the one who pours forgiveness into our lives. Amen. Amen. Let us read the call to worship together. God of fruitful labor, work sometimes brings out the worst in us, at home, at school, in the workplace, even in our relationship with you, we too easily question what others do and get, instead of taking care of our own business. Take away our bitterness, teach us the art of the careful complaint. Give us grateful hearts, we pray. Amen. Hear this prayer. God of surprises, we come here from the weariness of the weak, from various triumphs, from fears and doubts. Open our hearts to receive your surprising message of hope for all people. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let us pray together. Merciful, Merciful God. God. Forgive us for our times when we have failed to appreciate the capacity for greatness of the people you have placed among us. Open our hearts to receive new members as full members of the community and to make room for the gifts they bring. Forgive us, O oh God, for the ways that we have overworked many of our volunteers. Show us how to lighten their load and how to honor both active members and shut-ins for the untiring service they have given over the years. Free us, O God, from the jealous thoughts that sometimes come from old guard, new guard thinking. Help us to resist attitudes toward ministry that are competitive or comparative. Let us sink in that you are the owner of the vineyard, and that we all look forward to the same reward, life everlasting in your presence forever. Open our eyes, O oh God, to new ministry opportunities that will bring you glory. Give us the ability to see willing souls among us who continue to stand in the hot sun, waiting to work for God. Open our eyes to ways to share leadership as we serve you through the ministries of this church. Amen. Amen. Hear these words of assurance. This is the good news. There is no ranking in God's kingdom. God graces everyone with the same gifts, mercy, restoration, new life. God has kept the covenant. We have been forgiven. We have been made new people. Thanks be to God. Amen. Please remain standing for the hymn.
provide Christ in us, our cornerstone. We will go forth in grace alone. Every soul we long to reach, every heart we hope to teach, every Let us read the scripture from Matthew responsibly. Like morning dew, like manna, fine as frost, may your word now cleanse and nourish us, O God. When evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his foreman, Summon the workers and give them their pay, beginning with those who came last and ending with the first. When those who had started to labor at five o'clock came, each of them received a denarius. Therefore, those who had come first thought they would receive more, but they were paid a denarius, the same as the others. And when they received it, they began to grumble against the landowner, saying, These men who were hired last only worked one hour. And yet you have rewarded them on the same level with us who have borne the greatest portion of the work and the heat of the day. The owner replied to one of them, Friend, I am not treating you unfairly. Did you not agree with me to work for a denarius? Take your pay and leave. I have chosen to pay the latecomers the same as I pay you. Am I not free to do as I wish with my own money? Or are you envious because I am generous? Thus the last will be first, and the first will be last. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated.
Thank you, Miss Deanna. Yes, I want Jesus to walk with me on this burdensome journey. Jesus to walk with me. May we pray. Come at dawn, come at noon, come late in the day. Come to the vineyard where the last and the first harvest God's good fruit together. Come, joyfully serving God. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, for Lord, you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Parables of the labors in the vineyard. If Christians tend to grumble, pity, and feel sorry for themselves, it's because they've forgotten grace. Murmuring stems from a belief that one deserves something more. As a result, they're never happy and become a complaining people. In this sermon on the parable of the workers in the vineyard from Matthew 21 and 16, the murmuring person has forgotten that everything is grace. This parable highlights the grumbling of those who have been in the faith for a long time. They are complainers. They feel they deserve more than others. They started out well but got into trouble later on. This parable applies to the human condition we experience even today. Christians have the gospel of Jesus Christ, but they do not continue in it. They get into some trouble. They become in, entitled and believe that they deserve more. What they forget is this, people of God. It is all grace. It's always been grace. In the Christian life, all is grace from the beginning to the end. Christians are called to do all things without murmuring, without grumbling. What a tragedy when Christian people become miserable. What a tragedy when they murmur. The same grace that saved them keeps them. Listen to the parable and rejoice, for it's all about grace. Most of us woke up this morning, maybe not feeling the greatest, and you, you, you begin to grumble and move through our, our day, you'll continue to murmur and grumble and not be happy. Things will get in the way of you being happy. We may dress it up in nicer words and say, oh, I'm just venting, Pastor. I'm being honest. Oh, wow, old Pastor Clarissa, I'm just getting it off my chest. Or even I'm sharing a prayer request. But God knows what we are doing. And if we really think about it, we often do too. Grumbling is the hum of the fallen human heart. And often a hallmark of Christians' indwelling sin. And that makes non-grumblers a peculiar people in the world. As Paul goes on to tell us in Philippians 2, 14 and 16... Do everything without grumbling or arguing so that you may be innocent and pure as God's perfect children who live in a world of corrupt and sinful people. You, you must shine among them like stars lighting up the sky as you offer them the message of life. If you do so, I shall have reason to be proud of you on the day of Christ because it will show them all my effort and work has not been wasted. People of God, in our text today, Jesus tells his disciples another parable about the kingdom of heaven. You'll recall that he told them he was the Messiah, the promised one of God, and that he was the rock and that in and through him they would find peace. He told them that the kingdom of heaven is the opposite way of the world. So instead of seeking the greatest, seeking to be the greatest, excuse me, they should be like little children and be the least. For in the kingdom of heaven, they are keepers, weepers, losers, 
and finders. Jesus told them that in the kingdom of heaven, there is unity. One shepherd, one flock. One is the loveliest number. And the unity is possible because of the greatest of God's forgiveness. Forgiveness that flows deep and wide. Also, Jesus tells them that in the kingdom, Christ gives abundantly and freely above and beyond all that we could possibly need, both now and in the ages to come. The landowner in our parable is the owner, and he had a vineyard. He had cultivating or pruning or harvesting that needed to be done, so he needed workers. So he goes out to the marketplace, to the street corners, where the laborers are just hanging out. The landowner goes out early, 6 o'clock in the morning, and he finds them already hanging out. The workers bargain it out and agree to work for the prevailing wage. They come to the vineyard and they get to work. The early bird gets the worm, as the saying goes. The landowner hires more worker at 9, at noon, and again at 3 o'clock. And he hires even more right before, right before, people of God, quitting time. Right before quitting time, he hires more workers. The whistle blows, the day is done, payday is here. So the landowner has the cashier to go pay the latecomers first. And so on until he gets to the ones that was first hired. Everyone receives a full pay. But not all are happy some are grumbling. Who's grumbling? It's the early birds. They have their eyes on themselves and their rights. They say, wait a minute, this isn't fair. We worked in this heat. But most of the other workers also worked in the heat. Those who came at nine, those who came at, not at noon, were in the vineyard and under the scorching sun as well just as those who, those who started at 6 in the morning. Others had felt the heat of the day. But they're not grumbling, only the early birds. The early birds struck a bargain with the landowner. We will work if you pay us for our work. We will work if you pay us for our work. The early birds came to the landowner's vineyard on their terms. They got going as they had bargained with the landlord. They would come to his vineyard and work, and he would give them what they deserved. That's the early bird way. That's the American way. Work hard, be better, and you will get what you deserve, a full prevailing wage. They had earned the wage, or so they thought. The landowner said, I choose to give to this last worker as I give to you. He did not say, I, as I pay to you. He said, I give to you. He didn't pay them. He gave to them. The landowner knew that even calling them to the vineyard early that morning was a gift because they weren't going to hang around and do nothing all day. They were going to be productive. They were going to work. So he had already gifted them by calling them to work in his vineyard. But the early birds weren't about to receive this gift. They rally together and they go to the landowner. This isn't fair, they say. We worked harder and longer than those others you hired last. We did more. We should get more. Better yet, we deserve more, landowner. Unfair? Says some voices within. That's not right, says another one. Desires become expectation, people of God. Expectation becomes rights. And instead of bringing our disappointment to God and allowing God's words to steady us, we let unmet desires fester into discontentment. Oh, people, we begin to grumble. Grumbling is more than the voice of discontentment, however. 
It is also the voice of unbelief. We grumble when our faith in God's good purpose falters. Unwilling to trust that God is crafting that disappointment for our goods, for our good, we have eyes only for the painfulness that we're experiencing right now. We forget. We forget to see the 12 bags of scraps that we collected to remind us of the blessing that happened in the breaking. Hallelujah, Lord. Hallelujah, Lord. We forget to see the 12 bags of scraps that was collected to remind us of the blessing that happened when God was breaking us. The Old Testament says that when the Israelites finished burying the last of the wilderness generation, no one from the original exodus from Egypt saw the promised land. Everyone died off that was the original Israelites. Everyone. The new generation was born after the final one was buried. Moses reveals God's purpose in all their desert trials. He says, God led you through the great and terrifying wilderness that he might humble you and test you to do your good, his good, in the end. Humble them that they may do God's good in the end. What a tragic commentary to on those graves in the desert. On every tombstone in that wilderness, people, were carved the words, we grumbled against our own good. We grumbled against our own good. 175 years, Fifth Avenue United Methodist Church, yet we grumble against our own good. Hallelujah, Lord. Preach to us today, dear Father. Preach to us. God has already told the Israelites as much after their first exodus of grumbling. God presented them with a choice. They could either diligently listen to the voice of the Lord, your God, Exodus 15 and 26, or they could follow the raging mob within themselves. Well, we know the story. Biblical scholars that we are, they followed the mob. As God continued to provide manna, continued to provide meat, as Moses goes up to get the Ten Commandments, they're down having a wonderful party, worshiping idols. And God was not pleased. They wandered 40 years just outside of what was the promised land. And they died, each and every one that had originally come out of the land of bondage, out of the land of Egypt, with tombstone that said, we grumbled against our own good. I have paid you what, you what I owe you. I have given you exactly what you deserve, said the landowner. Now take your pay and get out of here. And he sent them away. The landowner told them to take their wages and go away. The relationship such as it was, was over. Leave the vineyard, leave the kingdom of heaven. The early bird got the worm, all right. They would not receive the landowner's gift. They relied on their work, their effort. They did not rely on the landlord's promise but they relied on themselves. They received what they deserved and so much less than what could have been theirs. So much less than what could have been theirs, what the landlord, landowner wanted to give them. Notice how the other workers entered the vineyard. Yes, the landlord, landowner went out, I'm sorry, and sought them and found them just as he did the early birds. But unlike the early birds, no deal, no bargain was made. He promised, I will give you what is just and fair. They trusted him and entered his vineyard. The late comers received a full day's pay, as does everyone. 
He promised to give them what was fair, that is, what is just and right. And he did. It certainly was more than they deserved. They had not earned it. It was a gift from him. Our Lord gives to us generously as well. We pray, give us this day our daily bread, not pay us. And God does. God richly and daily provides us with all that we need to support this body and this human life that we live in. God has created us, given us breath and life and health and skill and abilities to enjoy the abundance of this life. So our Lord provides for us each and every day in our lives. Oh, but sometimes, people of God, we forget that. The Lord has freely given us life and salvation in Christ. Sometimes we forget that too, don't we? Life doesn't go well. Life can be hard, painful, and difficult. We try to worm our own way out of our own sin. We know the greatness of God's grace, but we ignore the reality of our own wickedness. We forget to ask for forgiveness. We forget to treat each other with kindness. We forget to be understanding. We forget compassion. But God's grace, the others, the one called later throughout the day, they could not do much. They could not earn their way. They were just getting hired, and, and the, and the workday was almost over. So they know they, they couldn't put in those kind of hours. So why did the landlord call them to the vineyard when he knew that they couldn't do eight hours worth of work? Because he knew they needed his provision. And he provided, even as God provides for us, fully, abundantly, and graciously. They still needed to t take care of a family or take care of themselves. They needed to buy food and clothing and shelter. So he knew they needed to work. And he was just going to be fair and just with them. We know the greatness of God's grace. At the end of the day and at the end of our lives, God gives us righteousness. A righteousness we desperately need, but church, believe me, we never, ever can earn. Thanks be to God that we are in God's house, in God's vineyard, the kingdom of heaven. Even as God calls us to the kingdom, God seeks for others who will trust God, who will trust God's word, whether in the morning, noonday, afternoon, or twilight. And God provides both now and in the ages to come, and he does it fairly. So no matter if someone comes to Christ as, as a young person or come to Christ well into their season of life, God provides unconditional, abundant grace and righteousness to all that come to him. As Christians, we have to work. But we do not work to get into the kingdom of God. We work because we're already in the kingdom. We are on God's team already, the hands, feet, and eyes, and ears, and mouth of Christ. The early workers forgot that. They got so busy trying to make provisions for themselves by working so hard, they forgot that God is the one that supplies all our needs. They did not focus on what the owner had done for them. They had not focused that the owner had already called them to work and they were going to be rewarded because of what they were already doing. People of God, when you recognize some grumbling words within yourself and within others, stop and ask yourself, what am I wanting right now more than I want God's will? What's so important that I'm going to grumble and be upset about instead of doing God's will? What craving has become more important than God's commandment to love God and love God's people with all my heart, with all my mind, with all my soul, with all my strength? What's more important than that? What desire has grown sweeter than knowing Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior? What's sweeter? Power, position, being able to be hurtful, 
Being able to complain, is that more than being the sweetness of Jesus Christ within your life? Grumbling does not sprout forth from us because of a problem out there, but because of a problem, church, within us. No outward circumstances compels us to grumble. The same apostle who said, do all things without grumbling, was wearing chains in prison for the gospel as Paul wrote this wonderful, wonderful scripture. Do all things without grumbling. Yet the the Philippians were drenched in gratitude. They weren't grumbling. More than that, at the center of Paul's letter is a Savior, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, who humbled himself to the point of death on the cross, not for himself, but for you and for me. And he never grumbled. He never murmured. He never said, as the the old gospel song goes, he never said a mumbling word. He hung there hour after hour after hour knowing that we were the only salvation. That he was the only salvation for a sin sick world. He hung there. God has given us everything we need to let go of grumbling. In addition to recognizing our grumbling, then we need to repent of those rebellious desires that would keep us from saying with Paul, It is my eagerness and my expectation and hope that Christ will be honored in my body, whether by life or by death, whether by comfort or disappointment, whether by hope fulfilled or hope deferred. It is my eager expectation that Christ will be honored. Not about me. Not about this this body that's going to turn to to dust and worms once again. But Christ, our Lord and Savior, will be honored. People will see Christ in who we are. People will come to Christ knowing that salvation is free. Grace is abundance. All we have to do is take these words and turn them back to the God who is our very present hate, help. In other words, we place grumbling with this righteous opposite, prayer. Prayer. Every decision to grumble is a decision not to pray, not to pour out our heart before God and not to draw near to God's powerful throne of grace. Grace. You want to say something wrong to someone or something hurtful to someone, pray. Ask God to remove whatever that is in your spirit that you won't be hurtful to someone. You won't say the wrong thing to someone that's that's probably going through stuff, that's experiencing things, family experiencing things, job experiencing things. And instead of praying through whatever, the grumbling that is inside yourself, You speak hurtfulness. Hurtfulness. Keep wrangling your focus back to God who made you. The God that knows you. Every secret of your heart, every desire of your spirit, God knows. You may not think that others know, and we probably don't. We don't know each other like that in the, in the trueness of who we are. But God knows. God is telling us, my grace is sufficient. My grace is sufficient. Of course, even in prayer, the fight continues. Our mind will often wander back to whatever person of circumstance that has agitated us. But keep bringing your mind back around. Keep wrangling your focus back to God who made you and who knows you and who loves you and who brought you through your circumstances, who allowed the breaking to happen so the blessing could occur. Grumbling cannot abide in the presence of Jesus. Over time, it must make way for gratitude. If we must bow the knee to faith, It must give way to praise. 
praise God. Praise God. Even in your circumstances, praise God. It's a form of prayer. As you praise God, you're praying to God. As you praise Jesus, you're praying to Jesus. You praise the Holy Spirit. You're praying to the Holy Spirit. You're saying, I can't do it by myself. Come into my life. Come into my life again and again and again because I'm, I'm, I'm always stumbling. I'm always struggling. But God is a God that forgives over and over and over and over again. We can never not get forgiveness from a God who is so full of grace, who is so full of mercy. People of God, stop grumbling. Stop grumbling. God said, I treated you fair. I treated you just. My son died on Calvary's cross for you that you could have life eternal with me. With me. Praise be to God. And surely the presence of the Lord is in this place. Join with us as we sing this beautiful, beautiful hymn. God is with us, church. God is with us. Surely the presence of the Lord is in this place. I can feel his mighty power. I can hear the brush of angel wings. I see glory on each face. Surely the presence of the Lord is in this place. Surely the presence of the Lord is in this place. I can feel his mighty power. I can hear the brush of angels' wings. I see glory on each face. Surely the presence of the Lord is in this place. Jesus, hallelujah. Praise his holy, holy name. Thank you, Lord. Turn to someone and just see the glory on their face. See the glory on their face. God is in this place. He is moving and he is doing great things for us. For us, church. We can't begin to give God back anything that God gives us. That's why his grace is freely given. Freely given. To each and every one of us. As we turn to our altar of prayers and concern of our struggles, of our situations, we lift up Brother Bob Crail. Brother Bob was on his way <laughs> to being in a, at a rehab setting and Unfortunately, he had a little fall. So he's back in freighter now, but Miss Jean said he's eating and, and getting better, and, but he's going to need to still go and, and get some strength back. As many of us know, being in the hospital over time, the, the body becomes weak. So he's got to go and get some rehab, and, and we pray that that will transition this week. We pray for Miss Jean and the daughters as they and the, and the grandchildren as they continue to provide support and care for Brother Bob Crail. We thank God, thank God for my shipmate who I love so very much. I thank God for his care of the family. Lord, in your mercy. We are praying for Brother Bob and Sister Joy Kuhop. 
they're still going through their challenges of, of healing. Brother Bob is, after his fall, um, is still not doing well. They're going to be transitioning to another neurologist. He still has a neck brace. Uh, it's just going to be a journey. So they need our, our prayers of strength. They need our prayer of restoration. They need our prayers for God to be in the midst of all that they're going through. So we pray for God's mercy and God's grace. Lord, in your mercy. I was a potential juror for a case that has not occurred in over a century and a quarter, or maybe even a half, in the United Methodist, or the, I'll say the Methodist Church, in which a bishop was on trial. Church, it was the most hurtful time I've had in my pastoral vocation. And being a preacher's daughter, a pastor's daughter, knowing the struggles my dad had for over 60 years of carrying the cross of being a pastor. This was something. It was hurt. It was painful to see our church in such a place. Praise be to God. The bishop was found not guilty, but there is healing that's got to happen. As tens of thousands watched, those of us that was there in person in Glenview, Illinois, and those of, that watched it around the world being streamed live, to see our church have to resort to a court in which we didn't treat each other like brothers and sisters in Christ. It was painful. We have to pray for each other. We have to, church. We have to pray for our church. We're going through so much as it is, and now to have the brokenness of clergy laity, the pismacy, be so fragilely cracked, We need to pray. But God is a God of healing. God is a God of mercy. And we thank God. We thank God that healing has already happened. The bishop has not been in worship for 18 months in a United Methodist church or any church for 18 months. We celebrate she is Worshiping at Temple United Methodist Church in Chicago this morning, the first time in 18 months. As she said, she is away from her family for 18 months. And I don't know about you, but I feel that way with each one of you. You are family. You are family. And the beauty is that we don't get to decide on who that is. God has. Let's hold each other. Let's care for each other. Let's support each other a little bit better with a little more understanding and a little more compassion because you never know what a person is going through in their life. Like I said, we can only, you only share what you share. So the secrets of your heart is for God. But I thank God, I thank God, I thank God that healing has already started, and we pray for the fifth, for Fifth Avenue United Methodist Church, for United Methodism, for those that was the church that brought the charges, the, the, the bishop who faced the charges, and the jurors that did their diligence and obedience in deciding the verdict. Lord, in your mercy, God of grace and mercy, whether we are lifelong laborers or new arrivals in your vineyard. We know you value us just as we are. 
Hear now the prayers of thanks and concerns that we now speak aloud are raised silently from our hearts. So if someone would like to say a prayer out loud or ask for prayer out loud, we're available to hear that. God of the last, God of the first, God of all those in between. Hear these concerns as we seek your presence in our lives and in the world in need. Therefore, do not be like them, for your Father knows the things you have need of before you ask. Thank you, Jesus. In this manner, therefore, we pray, our Father, who art in heaven, kingdom and the power and the glory of God. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. As you are able with hearts that have been opened up with forgiveness from our Father up above, we ask you to stand as we sing our doxology. from whom all blessings pray together. God of endless patience, we know that the sound of our complaining is not the music that pleases your ears. We complain about the food that is under or overcooked, and you hear the stomachs that have no food. We whine about the bedding being too soft, and you see instead those whose bed is the sidewalk or the floor of a cell. May the offering we bring today be an act of praise that drowns out the noise of our complaining. May it find its way to bring comfort to your children, of little or nothing. And when that happens, may it be joy for our eyes and ears. In Christ we pray. Amen. Please remain standing for the hymn.
been forgiven, now go into a world that needs your forgiving, healing touch. Bring peace and hope to others, sharing God's love with them. Amen. Oh, Church of the Living God. Woo! Holy Spirit. Fire under my feet. Thank you, Lord. I don't know. Has this been a, a day that we needed just to love each other a little bit more? A little bit more, Church. The farmer's market was amazing yesterday. Um, crowd, more, crowded, or more crowded than usual on this time of year. And we were blessed to have um, our sisters from our Hmong congregation, Christ Way United Methodist Church in Milwaukee with us. They did um, make uh, uh, egg rolls and we have those available to purchase this morning. They're already cooked. All you got to do is warm them up. If you're not inclined to purchase, donations are greatly appreciated. The ministry for, this, for them is they have three Filipino students that are going to school here in America, and they sponsor, they're sponsoring them. So all this um, that they're doing through the egg roll sale, which happened just yesterday and will happen full-blown on the 7th of October, they will do the entire farmer's market. Um, we will not sell breakfast sandwiches on that Saturday. Uh, it's going towards helping them get ready to continue their studies here in America. So please, please go by Miss Marilyn, Miss um, Marilyn Kale and Miss Mary Barnard, Barnett are over in the North X over here, ready to take your joyful, joyful given funds to help these wonderful ministries. And we just really appreciate all that you're going to do to be a blessing um, for this ministry from Christway United Methodist Church, Pastor Nathan and, um, and his congregation. So come, go by, go by. Like I said, if you don't want them, you, if you purchase them, and um, I'm going to be taking all our, uh, the remaining egg rolls over to Carl's Place, um, our shelter here. So please be a blessing. Be a blessing. We just need to do that. Talk to your neighbor to tell them you love them. Love you, Miss Atlanta. Love you, Brother Doug. I don't know you. I needed a little love in my life. Amy had to go back home, so missing my child. Missing my child. And that United Methodist Church that Bianca takes her to, they're trying to grab my child. Like the time she's like, Mom, the pastor said hello, and he'd like to know, you know, if you want us to just transfer our membership. No. You can make a trek up here as, as often as you can to keep your membership. Come on, Miss Atlanta, my love. We're still praying for Miss Atlanta's healing as she continues to go through that. Uh, and God is good. God is good. Go from here as workers in God's upside-down kingdom, people of God. 
Where the last are first and the first are last. For needs are met, though, in miraculous ways. Hallelujah. And there is grace. Oh, people, hear this. There is grace enough for all. And may the blessing of God, the love of Jesus Christ, and the presence of the Holy Spirit surround you and sustain you in the coming days. Now unto him who keeps us from falling. Unto him who says there is plenty of work to be done. Come, you will be paid what you deserve. May his grace rest, rule, and abide within each of us, God's people. And we can say with uplifted voices, amen, 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 amen. and amen. amen. Thank you, Lord. Amen.